So welcome to today's session. Uh, we are focusing on the trial map um, and, and the randomization uh, that you would set when you're first creating a trial or setting up a trial. So I have a protocol here that I have opened in ARM. Uh, it's just an example protocol without anything particularly interesting in it. Uh, but I've got uh, 12 treatments and a handful of replicates just so we can um, kind of investigate uh, the different layout options um, when it comes to the trial map. So I'm starting in a protocol just so that way we can create a trial. And of course, the, really one of the first steps in the creating and setting up of a trial is the randomization. So I am um, doing that here in this create trial mode because it's very easy to re-randomize and get a new randomization. Uh, once you get into a trial, if you've already had that trial created, uh, you can typically do most of these things um, if you don't have any data entered. Once you enter in data, then some of the re-randomizing uh, options uh, become disabled because ARM wouldn't be able to know how to um, link the data back if, if we totally tossed out the assignment of your, your treatment and the plots. So uh, certainly once, you know, before, before you put data in, uh, this is all possible uh, in a trial, but I'm gonna do it even kind of before we're in the trial file, just for the, uh, the ease of, of use there. So uh, I guess as we, as we start here with cr creating the trial, that first step really is the, the trial map. And what comes up here is the randomization. We've just randomly assigned uh, treatments to the plots and the treatment description down below will show us kind of the, the color choice here. I'm just noticing I've got a couple of <laughs> kind of quirks. I'm not sure what I was doing to my settings, but I've got like seven and 11 are colored the exact same, um, which is a little odd. So let me just adjust over here on the right half side, we can uh, change the colors that are assigned. So I am clicking into treatment number 11 uh, to adjust the color and maybe I'll just pick this yellow instead, since I haven't used it previously uh, in another treatment. And I think that solves that one. Treatment nine is the same color as two, and it just has one of these um, patterns. I kind of like, I'll just keep them all flat. So we'll take this brown here. I said, I'm not quite sure what I did to make such an odd color combination. You can see there are a great number of colors and patterns available. Um, I, like I, said, I like to stick to these up here mostly, although I think it was orchard studies that had a lot of requirements for different colors or, or options. Uh, and just depending on how large your trial might be, uh, you might run into this type of trouble where you need more. So there's a there's at least a unique color without a pattern on, on those. Um, whether it's the, the cleanest color palette, if you will, maybe not, but we'll go with that. <clears throat> so you can assign particular colors if, if you care or, or have a, a distinction for matching um, those treatment numbers. Uh, looking here at the bottom half of the trial map, there's a few sections of, of settings. Uh, starting here under the options, this is really different options for how the map will display. So by default, we just have each plot as a square to just indicate where it is um, relative to the others and what's the plot and treatment assignment. Uh, if you want a more realistic view of really what that trial will look like, using the show true scale will draw the map draw those plots according to, uh, you know, to scale. 
with the width and the length that you have entered in settings. Uh, if you have any alley size, um, you know, buffers between plots, things like that uh, will all be incorporated into uh, the drawing of the map. So you can see now our plots are more realistic, realistically shaped uh, for what they really truly will be uh, in the field. I'm going to toggle that back off just so it's a little easier to view the randomization. You can also toggle um, the plot numbers if you don't want to see the plot numbers. Um, border plots would be any, uh, any plots that are empty. And you can create, create border plots around the outside um, over here on the properties panel. So if I wanted a border of one all the way around, I can do that. And then whether or not those should count for my plot numbers, uh, I can do that optionally here. So now this is plot 101, even though it's just a buffer and there's no assignment. And so the first plot with an actual treatment applied um, is actually 202. And then displaying those numbers, well, we can kind of see that um, visually there. And then of course, same thing with the treatment. You can use the treatment number or the treatment code. And so that ties us back to the treatment description again. That's where we started at. Um, and so the description really comes from the different treatment fields that you have filled in. Uh, I just had the treatment name in the, the protocol, but of course you would have you know, product rates that you're being applied, any sort of formulation, things like that, uh, that could be in this description. And then there is a code here. So you could have a freehand um, short code to refer to each one. You know, in my case, if I, I could come up with something like T2, T3, uh, something like that. Um, oops, and I pressed enter, which is gonna accidentally hit accept current. So instead of just moving to the next cell, I have now accidentally proceeded us into the trial. So let me cancel and go back to that protocol. My apologies. Nice thing is we can just hit randomize again and we'll start fresh with a new trial map. That was trying to fill in just that code. So you could you can fill in a code if you have a, a shorthand for what you would want to refer to those treatments as. Uh, just don't press enter like I did um, when leaving that cell. And then um, you can display that as the treatment code instead of just referring to uh, the number. So here, um, instead of just referring to treatment three, it's put in that code, which in my case, I wasn't very original and just called it T3 instead. Uh, but you can see like my untreated check um, kind of automatically had that CHK in there. So that's kind of how that can display you want to uh, call those treatments something else, basically. I'll just set these back to the way they were before. Um, moving on to the movement arrows. So that controls the direction that these arrows are being displayed here on the map. And so those really are kind of a custom order for how you may move through the field. And so we have two separate choices, um, an assessment order and a harvest order. So these can be used for you know, entering data, you know, for you to kind of signify what order you'll move through the field. So thinking of data collection, it wouldn't make sense uh, to sort by plot number uh, as you're, you're typing things in if you move through the field uh, like a serpentine order. So in this case right now, I've chose reverse serpentine within blocks. So I would start at plot 1012 and work my way down the row. And once I got to 101, I would skip over to plot 201 and work my way back up. 
So there really wouldn't be a way to just sort by plot number and fill in my data. Everything would be out of order. So the goal uh, for the movement arrows is to match up with the direction and flow that, that you would you know, take an assessment. And harvest order is the very same idea, but just gives you an option to choose a different direction. Uh, maybe for harvest now you've got equipment driving through the field instead of being on foot. So there might be just a different uh, order that that may occur. So those are uh, where those that information you can you can put in, which then can be used later on in, in the data collection. Or if you don't want to display those arrows at all uh, for just reviewing the map, we can of course turn those off at any point. Comment is just an open text um, box for putting in any comments. That would be if you were going to print out the trial map later, those comments then would uh, come across. And we'll get to this quality tab in a little bit. Um, this is really for looking at the randomization and, and the dispersion uh, of the map. But first, I kind of want to start with the, the process for adjusting the randomization. Um, so if uh, you have already decided on a randomization, um, maybe the, you know, the field has already been planted, um, when you're going to set up the map, uh, whatever the case may be, uh, ARM gives you some tools for making sure that you document the map the way it is, is planned to, to be laid out. So really the, the simplest way is to utilize this auto select for move. And it's really just a, a drag and drop. So for example, if my plot 101, I want to, I you know, have decided that that will have treatment number nine. If I click over here on treatment number nine, I've auto selected to move the, the treatment assignment. So I'm, it's only going to move that treatment assignment, which right now treatment nine is assigned to plot 105. So if I click on that nine, and then I can click and drag, and let go over the top of plot 101. And now that switches that assignment over. So now my plot 101 is assigned with treatment number nine. And I could continue down uh, whatever randomization that I have chosen. I can just continue to drag and find uh, whichever treatments you know, working down this replicate or whatever order that you, you're planning to work on um, to make sure that you have the treatment assignment matching your plot number. You can color. So right now we've been coloring by the treatment to see uh, the different treatments that we're looking at. If, get maybe a more overall view of the, the map. If we color by replicate, you can see uh, that we are in a randomized complete block. And so all 12 treatments um, are uh, across the, the field here. And then we have each replicate in its, in its own row. Sometimes though, uh, you might have a different different way to arrange this. Maybe our, the, the area we have in the field is very wide, but we don't have a lot of height. So we would actually want replicate two to be right next to replicate one. There's a couple of ways to do that. Um, if we're looking at the drag and drop, we can auto select for move the replicate. And now if I click into plot 201, you'll actually see that all of the plots in that second replicate are being selected when I click on it. So I can click and drag 201, and I'm going to drop my mouse right next to plot 112. And when I let go, since it's in the open area right next to it, uh, ARM will actually just make some room for us and insert uh, that entire replicate right next to our replicate number one. 
Now I did have this option to auto delete blank columns and rows within the map. So I would have had just a blank um, row where plot, excuse me, replicate two was previously. Um, so if I turn that off and then I move 401 over to be right next to three, replicate three, you can see this is, this is what typically would happen as you're moving uh, replicates around. Uh, you might end up with a bunch of empty rows or columns or something like that. So that auto delete, my map keeps resizing on me, uh, auto delete blank columns and rows within map uh, can be handy to, to click on if you're moving replicates around and don't want all of that extra space. Or you can always use the right click and I could delete that row out of the map since there's no plots in it. <clears throat> you can also use the right click if there's maybe like a, a uh, empty empty spot in the field um, that isn't isn't just met, you know kind of lined up with a particular um, buffer or anything like that. Um, if I right click and insert, maybe we have have a, a larger area between these replicates, for example. Uh, it's just what, what we have to uh, have in the field. I can insert a column. You really can insert it, insert it anywhere, uh, but that will put blank, blank plots uh, to give you that spacing you may need. And may, maybe there's a couple of them. Um, That'll just add add that spacing if if you want to to make things more more accurate. Maybe maybe there's every five plots there's um, space that you need. You can you can insert as many as as you would need. Um, if it's not an entire column but just a just a spot, uh, that can be a handy use for the auto select for move. Coming back here and using that third option to move the plot. So that will move the entire plot and treatment assignment. Um, so maybe in my case, I don't have that empty spot in the middle in my first row, but in my second row I do. So I could just move everything over um, and have that empty at, this, at the, uh, the right there. And again, just whatever possible combination you might have. Um, it kind of just helps you move around those those boxes, uh, that whole assignment of the, the plot uh, to be wherever it needs to be uh, to match up what you have in the field. So that, that the key really for um, getting the randomization to match uh, what is in the field that that auto select for move just depending on what component um, you you want to be changing uh, really have a lot of options for for moving things around and lining things up to match uh, next i'll move over to the settings so there's a button right here on the trial map to take us to the layout settings. So right now uh, I have that protocol open, uh, creating a new trial. So we see our protocol settings. If you're already in the trial, then this will open up the trial settings, but they're, they're both the same, um, same settings here. And specifically that layout tab really, um, is pertains to this randomization. And so we have some options that really pertain to just the numbering system um, used on the map. And so depending on whether uh, you're, you're numbering based on the, the replicate or by the block, uh, range by row and sequential are also uh, two other systems that, that we can uh, support for just how you would number uh, number of the plots in the map. You can control kind of what corner of the map ARAM starts that, that numbering system with. Uh, you know, serpentine numbering is, is an option you can toggle on. Um, the blocks as columns instead of rows. That basically 
rotates the map 90 degrees. So um, previously you saw our replicate uh, was kind of a horizontal one by 12 shape. Uh, this would instead have those 12 uh, treatments go vertically instead. Uh, just running through some of these other options, the non-randomized replicate, this is which replicate number should be non-randomized. So uh, if I set that to one, then in my first replicate, plot 101 will have treatment one assigned to it, 102 will have treatment two, 103 with treatment three, et cetera. Um, that, is, that is done in, in some cases uh, for, you know, kind of having that first replicate be handy for uh, field tours, um, a, a statistician, somebody um, who, who is really interested in a true randomization isn't necessarily a fan of that option. Um, some of these other options underneath that are for numbering and, and increments um, for, for how that numbering should start. So for example, the starting block number if this trial is you know, on, in the trial site, one of many, of course, across the entire field, uh, if, if you really don't like starting over with 101 because this trial is right in the middle of, of everything and you wanna kind of carry that plot system throughout your field, uh, you can do that and just adjust uh, the starting block number and also the starting plot offset. So to maybe demonstrate that, let's say this is actually um, block number nine. Then when I say, okay, we'll go back to that map and it will adjust our numbering. So you can see instead of starting at 101, we actually, uh, th this is actually block nine instead. And then this is block 10 and our map, we've only got two blocks now because of how we've arranged it, but it would extend on. And then this is 901, but maybe this isn't all the way to the left side of the field. So if we wanted to start with a different uh, number there, that would be your starting plot number. So maybe this is actually kind of the, the 15th plot um, from, from the left in our whole field, changing that. Again, this is just changing the numbering system that we have. So now we're starting at plot 915 instead and calculating from there. So just some options for, um, again, getting things to match what is, what is in the field. Um, you can even change the increment between blocks. Um, if some, some cases, maybe you want four digits, so then you would actually want it to jump by tens instead of ones or, or what have you. You can adjust the, the way the numbering will work. Then we have the alley width. So we mentioned that when we did the um, true scale. So that would be the amount of space that you would want between blocks. And there's no unit because it assumes that it's the same unit you have on the general tab for, for the plot size. So here I've got a 10 by 30 foot plot. So the assumption is that the alley width is also in feet. So it's a one foot alley uh, between the blocks and only a half foot alley between each individual plot. All right, so I'm gonna set those all back to the way they were before. Finally, the last option in this section is the treatment adjacency. So this is really for when we randomize the map, trying to, it, it's, it's kind of a tool for um, keeping a dispersion. Uh, specifically, uh, the, the treatment adjacency is an effort to avoid having the same treatment have touching each other or too close to each other in the, the different replicates. So if, if I set this to zero, if I didn't use any treatment adjacency at all, then 
when we randomize, and here it has re-randomized for me, and let's color by treatment, then there's a chance that this could occur right here. We kind of got lucky that it did happen this time. Treatment five um, in replicate one just happened to be right next to treatment five in replicate two. So that's what we're trying to avoid with the treatment adjacency is saying that there has to be at least one plot away from each other um, across those replicates. So they're not next to each other. Essentially what ARM does then is it still is generating a, a complete randomization, um, but if it arrives at a randomization like this one here, and actually we have got three of them in a row um, with treatment one over here. So that's even worse. If it'll generate the randomization and then it will check itself to see if there's any of those straight shots. So there's seven and eight too. So you can see how, how often it can happen just by chance. And if the randomization ARM chooses has any, any of those um, situations here where, where they're touching them, then it'll just randomize again. It'll just start from scratch and totally re-randomize um, until it has a case. And here I re-randomize kind of manually um, to see if we have any straight shots. And we've got one here, we've got three of them there. So we'd have to re-randomize again. Uh, so if we were doing this manually, you can imagine it might take a few tries in order to get it right. And we are not, not finding that. So instead using the settings and setting the adjacency, now if we set this to one, we ARM will continue to re-randomize until it gets one that matches that criteria, essentially, where there are no straight shots. So it looks like seven, actually seven, eight, they end up, end up making a little square here, but we've insisted that you can't be right across from each other. So it has to be at minimum one plot away. So kind of that kitty corner effect. I could even you know make that larger if I wanted to um, and go up to two. So now it has to be two plots away. So this one's a little harder to view the minimum. You can see things are just more, in general, more spread out. It's a lot harder to find. Here, looking at treatment four now in replicate one versus replicate two, it can't even be kitty corner. There was no way it could be on 210. It had to be two away. So you can see we just get more of a, more spread out then. Um, of course, there's an upper limit to how far you can get before you start running into each other. Um, I think it's one third of the, the number of treatments you have is, is your limit to that. But that's, that's one tool to kind of help disperse the treatments is that adjacency. And I think by default it is set to one. So that'll re-randomize again. And yep, now we have things be a little bit closer, but still trying to avoid those, those straight shots. And we'll see with the quality tab, some more, some more tools kind of in that same idea of, of getting a dispersion. So let's finish out these layout settings here. So this last section um, then kind of related to, to the block size. So this is another approach for, uh, I would say, changing the overall shape of your map. So I think this block size is probably the most commonly used option uh, of these here that we've seen on the layout. Um, really the, the most common question, I guess, that, that I get from, from a support standpoint for the, the trial map is, okay, I've got 12 treatments, I've got four replicates, uh, but I don't have space on, you know, in my field to fit all 12 treatments in, in a row. So I actually need, instead of a, you know, a 12 by four map, maybe I need a six by eight instead. So they, they look at all of those plots and say, boy, dragging and dropping all of this is not gonna be a lot of fun. Um, what, what can I do? And so that's really where the block size come in, comes into play. Uh, you can specify how many plots should be in that horizontal row, that, that block, 
uh, on your map. So if I change that to six, we'll see that the shape of the map will be totally different. And if I color by replicate to kind of visualize uh, what we have, now when we're going to create replicate one, we can only get six plots wide and then we have to start another row. So now we have two, uh, two rows here in our map devoted to replicate one and then replicate two, three, and four stacks on top of each other. We can also go the, the other direction. So uh, when we were showing the drag and drop, I made my plot really, my, my map really wide. So I had 12 in replicate one and then I want replicate two right next to it. So we actually had 24. So you can also set the block size even larger than a replicate. And then if you choose to fill blocks, then after replicate one is filled in, we can just keep going with the plots in replicate two. So this is another way to get to that same kind of similar map to what we had before when we were dragging and dropping the entire replicates. So now replicate one has been filled in and then we still have more space within our block so we can start putting in replicate two. And then three and four fill in. And you can have any combination, you know, those I pick really nice round numbers um, you could do something in between like 16 um, and just kind of see how that'll end up shaping out. This one ends up maybe a little weird because we fill in replicate one and then we only get four plots into replicate two. And then we start on that next block and do the rest of two and then three. So just depending on um, what your needs are, you can, can kind of get the shape of the map to work. Sometimes a little, a little um, manual labor, if you will, of, of dragging and dropping might be necessary. So maybe we really don't want to have our replicates broken up quite like that. Um, so then we could always move around. In this case, maybe our, our plots. So I could swap these around. So that way we've got things a little closer to each other. And one thing to, to notice that I'm auto selecting and I'm moving the, the plot. So the assignment of the replicate is, is staying with that, that movement. So for example, if I was just trying to move the treatment assignment, ARM is going to uh, kind of check our design to make sure that as we're moving treatments around, we don't invalidate our design. So if I'm trying to move just treatment nine over to plot 210, you'll see I have a big X and it doesn't actually move it. And that's because for a randomized complete block, I can't have treatment nine appearing twice in this red block, my replicate two, or I think it might be replicate three. Um, I can't have treatment nine occurring twice in the same replicate that would be invalid. So it's not letting me cross to a different replicate by just dragging just treatment nine over. And so that's another, another common question is, well, we had a mist spray. And so how can I move that uh, treatment? So that way treatment nine really is right in this spot of, of plot 210 with, you know, without, um, you know, ruining the whole study. And that's really the goal. If, if you move the entire plot, now we can have treatment nine where plot 210 is at without, you know, ruining the, the study design because we still have treatment nine in that replicate. So it can still be part of replicate two, even though it is spatially uh, you know, closer to that other replicate. And all I'd have to do, notice the, the, the plot numbers um, 
came with, but if I just renumber the plots, maybe I'll finish this, I'm trying to get these all in spatially together like this. Now, if I renumber my plot, since I did kind of make a mess, um, there's a button to renumber plots. So after you've moved everything around, uh, now it'll update. And so now again, we have that logical um, ordering of our plots. And again, that 210 is assigned to treatment nine now. So sometimes it takes a combination of setting your block size to get your overall shape correct, but then some, some dragging around, uh, just depending on kind of what, uh, what the target is, what the map might need. Uh, the last two options, uh, we'll actually see this one in a moment on the on the quality tab. And the final one is about split plots. So we took a look at that at our previous webinar with, with the multi-factor designs. So it doesn't really apply to us here today in an, in an RCB design. So that's all of the, the settings. Again, that's the layout tab. So in a protocol, you can um, you can put any any defaults or, or things you would expect or typical um, settings perhaps for for that type of study. Uh, but then it really does come down to the the trial um, is really when when these options come alive of sorts uh, when we're creating a trial and, and generating that randomization. Um, is really when, when these options all kick in and, and take effect. So let me put back our block size options. I think everything else is pretty much as default. So we'll get kind of a brand new randomization here and color by treatment. So the last, but definitely not least, would be the quality tab. <clears throat> so this contains a few tools for um, really evaluating the randomization that ARM has given you. So maybe we actually want to have, you know, use ARM as the tool to decide what randomization we're going to use. And so uh, that is certainly viable. Um, ARM just randomly assigns uh, the, the treatments according to your trial design, as we had, had mentioned uh, before. And so we have some tools to really uh, try to decide if this randomization is, is good for us. Is, is this one we should use or should we discard it? And you know, we always have the option to re-randomize. Again, that button available, at least until you've entered data in the trial. So in general, when you're looking at a randomization, um, really the decision, what you wanna look for, isn't so much if it's random. You know, a, stat, you know a, a stats person would say, well, technically this is just as random as any other chosen um, map because it was just randomly generated uh, the assignment of the treatment to the plot. Really what a, a researcher is looking for is a dispersion. When we were playing with that treatment adjacency and then turned it off, we were not really getting a very good dispersion of the, the plots. We had several treatments just right next to each other in the field. And if there's any you know, unknown variation in the in the field or uh, wherever this trial is is occurring, um, if there's unknown variation that, that we can't control, you're really opening up some um, some troubles for you. You want to have a good dispersion across the field, um, so that way when you're analyzing the data, if there is a difference between treatments, you're confident the difference is because of the product that was applied and not just where that product happened to be landing in the field. 
So for example, just looking at this randomization, I noticed that treatment 11 seems to happen, you know, is occurring on really this, this right half of the field. So even the right third, really, it's only these four, um, four columns is really all it ever occurs on. So if by chance this happens to be the, the best yielding side of the field, or happens to have the, the worst drainage or you know, whatever the case may be, then when we get done and we're analyzing the data, if treatment 11 looks significantly different than others, is it because treatment 11 is different or is it because it happened to land in the part of the field that was different from you know, treatment one or treatment 10? <clears throat> So that's where we really want that dispersion. So everything's fair from the get-go essentially. And so that's the goal with the quality tab is to um, create the, the best randomization that we can. So um, really two, two main tools here. The one on the left is a suggested block size. So this, uh, really, I guess the theory behind this one is if you have some choice in the, the shape of your map, so we would have some control over the, the block size that we choose, then the ideal choice would be to make the replicate as close to a square as possible. So here in this, uh, table, we have various block sizes. So a block size of four, block size of six, and a block size of 12. You can see we're trying to draw out the replicate shape so you can visualize it. And again, that's kind of using that show true scale idea of, of really what the, the replicate will be shaped as with the, the plot dimensions and all of that. So as we start out, we said, okay, well, we have a block size of 12. We have so many treatments here that really ends up being long and narrow. So especially for a field uh, where we might not have uh, so much control over the field conditions, if there's any sort of, of gradient or variation in, in the field, um, we're really gonna have a lot, of, a lot more uncontrolled variance in our replicate. And the goal of the RCB is to get those blocks as homogeneous as possible. We want that block to be the same um, or as close to the same as possible so we can make good comparisons later on. So the idea is kind of geometrically speaking, if we can get the replicate to be about a closer to a square than a long rectangle that these others end up being, the more square we can get that replicate shape then the less variability we might be subjected to um, out in the field. So uh, that's the idea here. And so ARIM is calculating based on you know, our, our plot dimensions, how wide is the replicate gonna become? How long is the replicate going to be? And then really the way, the, the numeric way to say how square um, can we get things is the surface to area um, calculation. We're just trying to minimize that. So the, this square uh, and this having a block size of six is pretty close to a square uh, from what I can tell. Then that really minimizes the surface to area uh, ratio compared to this really long and, and narrow replicate has a worse, uh, ratio. So that's how ARM calculates a suggested block size. So we put an asterisk and a bold to say that of these options, and we try to make it round. So of course, you know, a replicate of seven is going to make a weird shape. So we're trying to, to have uh, round numbers based on how many treatments we have. A replicate size of six in this case really creates the most square shape that we can. So ARM is suggesting that we use a block size of six. 
And so if I select that six and press the apply button, it'll go into settings and change that block size into six and we'll re-randomize now. And just as we had seen before, the impact of that block size now we have a more, hopefully now would be a more homogeneous block um, because it's, it's closer to being a square. And of course that might not apply uh, for, for your type of trial. Um, if it's in a greenhouse, it may not matter at all where those plots are at, um, but this can be a tool if there is any of that concern um, for that, trying to, to kind of find the, the best shape for your replicate. And of course, there's always, you know, there's always the hurdle of just still trying to fit it into the field. Maybe I don't have a six by eight area in my map to, to match. You can still um, leverage the, the auto select for move. So maybe um, we still have that original size of, of 12 wide to fit. It works pretty conveniently in this case, since our block size is half of the uh, number of treatments, maybe I just drag and drop and put replicate one next to replicate two. I want to turn that on so I don't have a bunch of empty rows and replicate four next to replicate three. And now I'm back to really the same shape. If I color by treatment, we're in that same shape we always were, but our replicates are shaped better. So we'll end up with, with a better um, statistics, uh, hopefully with that homogeneous shape there. So it can become a little bit of an art form, um, depending, depending on all of the parameters you've got uh, to try to work with. Um, but just the hope is, is using the, the tool to uh, get some inspiration, if you will, of what would work. And maybe, um, maybe block, the block size of four would work better with the practical limitations I have in the field. Uh, you can at least say that, well, a block size of four is closer to a square than a block size of 12. So maybe I'll make that work. It doesn't, doesn't mean you always have to pick the optimum one of the, the, the choices. You can at least use that uh, value to, to get closer to a square at least. All right, the other option here, the other tool, if you will, here on that quality tab, we have a table looking at the, really the, the treatment dispersion. So let me color my treatment here with the map we've got. Back over on the quality, then there's a couple of calculations here. Um, the first one is the, um, it is really for the edge effect. So we have a tally of how many times each treatment is on the edge of the field of the map here. So we bold the largest value, which in this case, treatment two is always at the edge. So all four of them are out there on the edge. And then scanning down the rest, the smallest value ends up um, being in italics, or I guess in this case, we've got a zero, so he didn't even end up in, in the calculation. But this gives us a nice quick look at um, how, which treatments might have, you know, might re be receiving more of an edge effect than others. Of course, we'd really ideally want that value balanced out. Of course, that's only if there is a concern for an edge effect. Maybe we're gonna use that border plot option and there really isn't a concern that the performance of the plot could be altered based on um, being on the outside or the inside of her map. That's kind of a question for, for the research of whether we care or not. Um, ARM has that calculation for when it might matter, but certainly, um, doesn't mean that you'd have to use it if it doesn't apply. But this would warn us that if 
um, there's a chance that being one of the outside plots could impact your performance, um, much like we did with the uh, block size. You really want you want the treatments to be treated fairly um, with respect to where it is in, in the field. Uh, so we can minimize that unexplained error, the unexplained um, differences that we, that we would see in, in their performance. So we really wouldn't feel great with treatment 10 always being on the inside and yet having treatment two always be on the outside. So we, if we really are uncomfortable with that, simplest thing would be just to hit re-randomize. And we can generate a, a brand new map. Of course, I had done some drag and dropping, so I'll have to repeat that again. Um, oops. Try to drag and drop the replicate. That'll move the entire replicate next to each other so we can get that same shape as we had before. <clears throat> and it looks like we still kind of have some similar problems, but that might just be the way it is. Um, but at any rate, you can see that the table will then update as you make changes or get a new randomization. Uh, the, other, the other calculation, we have a few different columns, but they all stem uh, from a calculation called average distance. And it is really a calculation to try to quantify uh, what we mean by dispersion. So um, you know, as we mentioned, we, we don't want to just have a random occurrence of treatments, but we want them spread out as evenly as we can across the map. And to cherry pick here, look at treatment eight. He ends up being really in the middle. Treatment eight and treatment three are kind of in this middle core section here, whereas treatment four always seems to be kind of on the outside. So uh, trying to get a, a more fair dispersion of, of treatments we calculate this average distance. And for the math lovers out there, I've just got a quick summary of, of how this is calculated. Um, it's the average distance of treatment comparison is, is really uh, what this calculation is called. It's from Van S, um, from Cornell had, had created this calculation. And so we've replicated it in ARM. Um, you're really just measuring the distance uh, between plot centers. And again, it will be for a true scale. I kept it simple with the squares here, but it, it is using those map dimensions that we were editing before, including any buffers, you know, plot width or uh, alley widths and things like that are also included. It's going to measure the distance between plot centers um, for each treatment pair. So this is looking at uh, comparing treatment one and treatment two, we're going to measure the difference in each replicate of how far apart those are. And then we'll take the average of those distances. So now we have a average between treatment one and treatment two of how far apart they are between each other on average across those replicates. Then we'll do that for all of the pairs for the one treatment. So let's repeat that for treatment one and treatment three, and treatment one and treatment four, et cetera, and get an average of each of those pairing. And if you take the average of all of those averages, so it's kind of a, a layered average, if you will, becomes that average distance of treatment comparison that we see in the table. So that value there is this average distance. So our example here, the average distance of treatment one compared to all of the other treatments is 33. And again, that'll match the, uh, the plot dimension of, of feet, I believe in this case we had. So the goal 33 itself doesn't really matter. Of course, it's gonna depend entirely on how many treatments and your plot size. So the value itself doesn't hold much meaning. 
but what does is the value relative to the other treatments. So what we're looking for is consistency. We want to have each treatment more or less about the same distance away as other treatments. So real quick, I'm gonna hit pre-randomize to get back to my original uh, plot, my uh, shape here. And I think that'll create a little more extreme. I know we want our block size of 12. That'll kind of help as well. Uh, kind of stepping back from some of our improvements uh, to really have a more extreme example. Our average distance now, um, the numbers have increased. That doesn't really matter, but the, the spread of them has also increased. And so we can see again, the bold is the largest. So treatment three has an average of 58 feet from you know, all of the other treatments. And that makes sense because if we look at treatment three, the position of treatment three relative to the replicate, it is always on the outside edge. So here we're um, only one plot from the edge. Uh, here we are on the very far right-hand side. This is on the very left, and this is only one from the left. So we're always on the outer side of the replicate. So it's always farther away from these other treatments compared to our smallest one, which is treatment 12. If we look at treatment 12, it's always pretty close to the middle of the replicate. These right in the middle or one or two plots away. So treatment 12 ends up being closer to the other treatments um, than treatment three does. Now it is a balancing act, uh, of course. You, can, you won't have all the numbers be identical, um, but that's a way to kind of quantify that um, eyeballing that a researcher would do to get the feel for how spread out this is. And so uh, just depending on how many numbers you want to dive into, we, we give the standard deviation, uh, which would show kind of how, how consistent that is, and then the minimum and the maximum as well. Um, so just depending on how deep you want to dive into that, you can get really statistical in, in, you know, in that sense of, of seeing how those numbers play out. Uh, but the bare minimum really just, just look down that list of average distances and see what stands out. Um, overall, we really didn't do too bad. They're, they're mostly all in the, the 40s other than a couple of these extreme cases. And so if we could, we can live with that. Treatment three is, is maybe a little, a little wild, but that the worst middle one wasn't so bad. So maybe we can live with it or maybe, maybe we'd rather re-randomize because we aren't, um, maybe we're not too thrilled or we're kind of stuck with this plot's shape, trial shape. So we can't do any of the block sizes. Uh, so we're just gonna keep re-randomizing until we get a, a more consistent, this looks like it's kind of similar, different treatment. Treatment eight now is the one that's really extreme uh, and treatment 11 is in the middle. So maybe we don't really like that one. Um, that's, that's just a way to kind of use use that calculation um, to get a sense, um, put a number to that sense, that intuition you may have from looking at a map uh, to decide if it's, if it's spread out enough uh, or not. And actually, if we, you know, if we make this suggested block size change, I'd specifically roll that back because that typically creates a little more extreme um, values, uh, but you can see if you put these together, then just putting that kind of square shape, obviously the numbers themselves are smaller, but actually our consistency is better. Um, 36 is the worst and, or the largest and 29 is the smallest. We actually have a really nice consistent um, dispersion as well. Uh, so sometimes these options kind of, kind of work, work together to make the, the, the best randomization uh, that you can. All right, well, 
I got a little long-winded, ran just a couple minutes over. Uh, I appreciate you guys joining us today. That's about all I had to cover. Uh, I can stay on for, for a couple minutes if there are questions, but don't want to hold anyone hostage. So uh, appreciate appreciate you joining us today, as well as you know over the last uh, couple of months of, of running webinars, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning, uh, we'll, we're going on hiatus now for, for a little while, um, but be looking for us again uh, when fall comes. Uh, we'll, we'll do the, the other side of the coin, um, working on, on trial summaries and, and trial related features and some statistics if, if you're brave enough. So thanks everybody.